Well, as we're going to read today in Luke chapter 2, Luke was a doctor, Dr. Luke, right? And so when you read through this, uh, this birth story of Jesus, I want so many more details, right? But Luke is a doctor, so he's doing doctor's notes, all right? And so he includes the history. He includes like these important facts. He includes some of these other things, but he leaves out some of the stuff where I would tell the story. You know what I mean? Like if it's a doctor dictating stuff into his little dictaphone, right? And then it's going to put it in the file. It's like uh, if he was telling a birth story, it would look something like this. Patient came in, dilated six centimeters, you know, and then it's, then, then it's like uh, after uh, three pushes, boom, baby's here, you know, whatever, healthy, all the things, right? Three sentences. This is like doctor's notes. Well, well that's totally different than if you live through it, right? And it's your birth story. Uh, I, I can remember for us with our second child, Julia, like the doctor would have said just that, like uh, patient came in six centimeters, you know, had the quick push delivery, bam, done, right? You know, that, that would have been the doctor's notes. But for us, we were living a whole different reality than his notes. And, and, and so we had a 15-month-old and my wife woke up in the midst of labor and she realized she had slept through part of it. And so she decides that she should take a shower because that's what you do. And, and she wanted to get ready for the hospital. And so, like, I'm getting our 15-month-old uh, ready to go. And I'm throwing her into a car seat and getting her ready to go uh, to the hospital with us. So we're calling my wife's parents. And, and her dad is going to meet us at the Harris Theater because that's what you do. And, and so we're in the parking lot and we're driving up. And my wife is like, I'm going to have this baby in the car. Get me to the hospital, right? And, and I'm thinking, I really don't want to do that because, like, I don't want to deliver the baby in the car because, like, you know, it, it, I don't I don't know what's going to happen there like I, I should not be trusted with this responsibility and, and so we pull up into the parking lot and my father-in-law gets out and he decides this is the time for a conversation <laughs> and my wife is like just get Molly and go you know like she is like Rama so we pull up into the parking lot we go into the hospital and and we walk up we've already done all of our pre-registration we filled out all the forms oh we don't have your registration on file and, and so she's like feeling this this huge pregnancy pains, you know, and we're like, all right, well, fine, I'll register. And she goes to the restroom, and her water breaks in the restroom, and then it's like full on. She's like, get me in a room, you know what I'm saying? And, and then, boom, the baby is born, all right? And so, uh, like, doctor's notes, but she came in six centimeters, you know, after an hour, delivery, boom, healthy baby, right? And, and our version of what happened involves so much more. And so as we dig into these doctor's notes, Today, I hope that you can see this birth story of Jesus through new eyes. That you can see it through the eyes of Mary and Joseph and all the people that were a part of this story. Uh, and you can see that it wasn't this story about Christmas, but it was something even better. Because God knew exactly what they needed, and he gave exactly what they needed. So let's look together. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. So in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to be registered, each to his own town. Now, I want you to think about what's happened in Mary and Joseph's life. They have this betrothal, this young girl. She's visited by the angel. You're going to have the Son of God. It's going to be this unbelievable virgin birth. The Holy Spirit's going to come on you. Uh, God himself is going to place his Son inside of you, and you're going to have this life. She says, let it be. Let it be. Like, all my plans are ruined. All these things that I thought were going to have, they're ruined. Like, I, I don't know what's going to happen with Joseph. He could just divorce me. I could be the single mom. I could get stoned because he would think I committed adultery even though I didn't. People could think bad things about us even if we do get married, that, that we were together before we got married, and they could ostracize us from this community or whatever it is. And she just said, let it be. And, and, and so then the angel visits Joseph. He says, yes, you are not the father. It is the Lord. And, and so you marry her anyway. And so he says, yes. And he's willing to take the shame and the pain and everything that goes along with it. He takes her home to marry her that very day. And, and so he decides they won't be together until after the baby is born. So nobody could say this is his child. And so they're settling into life. They're selling into life in Nazareth. They have this life together. They're newlyweds. And, and so you would think what they need most is this season of rest. I mean, their life has been totally upended, hasn't it? 
Like everything that they had planned, they thought the betrothal was going to be a year. It wasn't a year long process. Like things were not ready. And so Joseph is working extra hard. And then you have Mary and she's pregnant. And so they're getting ready for the baby. And, and they're this poor family. They're scraping together everything that they need. And, and it's Mary's ninth month of pregnancy. And so you would think like what they need most is this season of rest. But, but is that what they got? No, because God knew exactly what they needed. Now, can you imagine when Joseph comes home, babe, I just want you to know that I heard the news today. What, what news did you hear? Uh, we're going to have to go to my hometown and we're going to have to register. Uh, say what now? Uh, because I'm nine months pregnant and, and, and we're going to have to go 85 miles with no vehicle, right? Uh, we're going to have to go 85 miles away when I'm nine months pregnant. We're gonna, really? Really? Uh, and, and what are we going to have to do while we're there? Well, I've got to sign my name so that we're registered so the Romans who are in charge of us can know who all is present. And then we're going to have to take what little money we have that we've saved for Jesus' arrival, and we're going to have to give it to them. Now, when you think about that, it, it, can you imagine how deflated they must have felt? Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but after a shakeup that they've had, you would think, that what they need most is rest. But here's the thing. God knew exactly what they needed and he gave it to them. And sometimes it's different than what we think we need or what we want. R write, write this down. There's, there's one thing I'm going to say today. And this is the main thing. I'm going to say it through the whole deal. Hopefully you can remember it uh, for next week and for your whole life. Right? So here, here's what it is. More than a night of peace. More than a night of peace. What they needed most was calm and comfort in the midst of chaos. More than one peaceful night. More than everything going right for one day so that it's this perfect delivery, this perfect trip, or this perfect experience. More, more than one day where it's a life of ease and everything's okay and nothing goes wrong. More than like this boring, everyday, mundane thing. They needed to learn peace in the midst of chaos. They needed to experience what it was like to have the whole world fall apart around them and still know calm and comfort from the love of God. It was so much more what they needed. Because it was going to prepare them for what was ahead. Now, now look at what it says. Verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Now, um, I, I just want to do a quick poll of you ladies right here, okay? I want you to remember the last days of your pregnancy, right? I want you to remember the last day. You got it in your brain? Like, can you put yourself back there? I know sometimes when you give birth, it gives you amnesia because then you want to have another one, right? But, like, <laughs> I just want you to remember the last days uh, uh, of your pregnancy, okay? Now, now, show of hands, show of hands, how, how many of you, some of you, you had the best pregnancy ever, right? You were glowing. You loved being pregnant. You had energy for days, right? It, you worked out until the day of your delivery. Every night, you had a total full night's sleep, totally rest. Your exact quote was this. I, I wish this little one could stay in here just a little longer. Like how many of you show of hands? How many of you? That was you. All right. Not a single person. All right. Now, now how many of you would be in the opposite category? Uh, others of you are on the opposite end of the pendulum. You, you would have given your left arm for an hour's sleep, right? You, you, you were struggling to find a comfortable position. You had to pee every 15 minutes. You were tired. You were cranky. You just plain done with little Johnny kicking into your rib cage. You were ready to get this baby out of me now, right? Like this is, I'm going to walk the baby out. I'm going to drink tea to get the baby out. I'm going to do whatever. Just get this baby out of me. Like how many of you, that was you. All right, much more of you. All right, now the Bible, Bible doesn't tell us what kind of pregnancy Mary had. But I have never met a woman who says, you know what I would like to do the last days of my pregnancy? Let me walk an ultra marathon. <laughs> How about that? Like this was a trip that would normally take families a week. This is 20 miles a day for four days. Right? Like you're going through rugged country. You're going through hills, valleys, mountainous regions. Like, this, this is a trip where even if they had a donkey, like, can you imagine being nine months pregnant, like, bumping, a, <laughs> like, bumping along? Like, you're going to have to pee every five minutes. Like, it's like, pit stop, Joseph. Really? Come on. Like, I guarantee you, if we don't hurry up, we're going to get there. We're not going to find a place. Like, right? You know, it's, it's like, it, it, and so can you imagine nine months? It, and why are they having to do this? She has the son of God who's going to set people free inside of her, but they have to go and register for an oppressive government who's going to steal their money. 
And we didn't think about that. But they had to. But God knew exactly what they needed. More than one day's peace, more than a perfect birth plan. Like, when you think about this, her whole birth plan is out the window. Like, her family's not going to be there. She's with Joseph's side of the family. Like, her mom is not going to be able to help with the delivery. Her sisters are not going to be able. She's going to be alone. Like, this young teenage girl who had this birth plan ready to go, she's like, I'm going to get some water, and then I'm going to have the music playing in the background, and then it's going to be this unbelievable time in Nazareth town, right? Like, this is her birth plan. And then all of a sudden, right at the end, it's totally shaken up by this oppressive decree from a foreign government who wants to steal their money. And she has to go for at least a week-long trip, walking 20 miles a day while she's not months pregnant up down up down just so they can give away the little bit of money they have now does anybody say what a treasured wonderful day that is or do you look at that and say that's a day from Hades right there right now it's all in your perspective because see God knows what you need and sometimes what you need is not what you want and so in the middle of this look at what happens more than a night of peace, they needed calm and comfort in the midst of chaos. Look what it says, verse 6. So while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And she laid him in a manger. Why? What does it say? Because there was what? No room. No room in the inn. Now, we don't really know exactly what the inn was like. Like, Bethlehem was a small, small town. And so it wasn't like a hotel bed and breakfast. Like it wasn't an Airbnb, right? Like this is not the situation. What they probably had was this large open square that, that was surrounded, had walls, but it was just kind of open air. And it was almost like a, a caravan RV park, right? Like this is, so everybody would roll into this one open air space. They would pick spots and they would set up their little sleeping area and arrangements. They would cook for themselves. They had to do these things. And then around it, there were caves that, they could put their animals or there was little stables connected to the outside of the three walls and they could put their animals there. And so we don't know if she was having contractions or when she comes up or if she's just thinking, man, you know, it's probably because I just walked 80 miles. Thanks a lot, Romans, right? You know, and in the middle of the deal, we, we don't know if she was already in labor when she got there, but I want you to picture this. Like, can you imagine feeling more alone and less cared for? I mean, here she is, this young Teenage mom, can you imagine how powerless Joseph feels? They get there, and there's not a single spot left. There's nowhere in the end. Can you imagine Joseph going around and saying this? Like, think about the crudeness and crassness of this culture. Like, they're there, and, and, and if your wife is in labor, like going up to, hey, can, I, can, I, can you switch spots with me? Can you please give me the spot? And, and, and nobody will do it. Like, can you imagine? I mean, there's houses around, people's houses and they could have welcomed the visitor in, and nobody does. Like, they hear her screaming in birth pains, and there's not a single one to offer any assistance. It doesn't say that she had any help with the delivery. Like, she has to deliver. Can you imagine as a teenager birthing the baby? You've never done it before. You don't know exactly what's going on. And in the middle of this moment, they're completely and utterly alone. They don't feel cared for. They don't feel loved. They feel stressed. Like, in the middle of this, they're like, okay, I guess we're just going to have to go where the animals are. There's nowhere else that we can go. Nobody's opening up their home. Nobody is helping us. Nobody cares. Nobody loves us. Nobody's here for us. Like, can you imagine how that felt in that moment? Like, it was not a storybook Christmas. But God knew what they needed. And in more than one night of peace, they needed to understand calm and comfort in the midst of chaos. See, peace only lasts by our circumstances for a moment. That's what this world is after. They want happiness. It's like, I want everything to be good. It's good. It's good. Like, my finances are good. Like, my life is good. My health is good. My marriage is good. My kids are good. Like, my job is good. And if all those things are good, or if more of them are good than there are bad, then I'll say, life is happy. But God doesn't just want you to be happy. He wants you to know peace and calm and comfort no matter what you're walking through. Like, he wants you to walk through the fires of this life. Like, literally, the worst time in your marriage, the worst time with your kids, the worst time with your health, the worst time with your job. He wants you to be able to walk through all of those seasons and the peace that you have not be dependent on your circumstances at all. He knows what you need more than a night of peace is this ability to tap into calm and comfort no matter what's going on in your life. 
And so look at what happens. She gives birth and she does what all the moms are doing. It was all the rage to wrap them in swaddling clothes. They, they thought that it would keep their arms and their legs straight. And so they swaddled them up tight and they laid them. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to lay them. So Joseph takes this little feed trough and he clears out the stuff from the animals and he puts the son of God into the manger. That's crazy. Like, have you heard what heaven is like? <laughs> I mean, you read the descriptions. Transparent, pure gold is the paving material. Uh, like, the passage in Isaiah, the train of God's robe fills the temple with glory, like from a robe. It's crazy. And Jesus forfeits all of that. And he empties himself so that he can be born for you and for me. And he exchanges the glory of heaven for a poor family that nobody cares about. That's totally on the margins. And there's nowhere even for them to go. Nobody welcomes them into their home. Nobody offers them a meal. Nobody does any of this. And nobody will give up their spot. And they lay him in the manger because that's the only spot they've got to lay him. But God knew exactly what they needed. More than a night of peace, they needed to be able to tap into calm and comfort in the midst of chaos. So look at what happens. Look at what it says, verse 8. So in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. Everybody say, by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now, this is crazy to me, all right? Like, this is the biggest event that's ever happened on planet Earth. And God is in heaven saying, I've got to find some people that are going to announce the biggest event that's ever happened on planet Earth. Who should I pick? Now, I want you to think about this. Who would you pick? A PR firm. You would pick somebody who has a huge social media platform. Somebody who has a presence on Twitter or whatever it is, right? Like you would pick a newscaster. You would pick like a famous TV preacher who sometimes preaches the gospel, right? Like this is, this is who you would pick, right? Like you would pick them and you would say, get my message out, dog, right? Like this is what you would do. And in the middle of this, who does God pick? People that everybody distrusts. Do you know the shepherds were not even allowed to testify in court? They were considered unclean. They had to stay out in the fields with their sheep so they couldn't observe all the rituals and laws that the Jews had. And so even these shepherds who were probably keeping the flock to be sacrificed at the temple, even they were considered unclean. And so here they are, they're out in the middle of the field. It was a lonely job. It was a, a job where people didn't respect you. It was somebody else who's out on the margins. And God says, they're perfect. I'm going to pick them and let them announce the biggest news on the history of the planet. You say, what qualifies me to share the good news about Jesus? If he picks the shepherds, he picks you. So look at what happens. This angel appears and God's glory radiates the night sky. Have you ever been out in the country in the middle of nowhere and you're able to look up at the stars? You don't have any of the lights. It's amazing, isn't it? All of a sudden, this bright light that's the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, hovers down around this angel. And this angel says, glory to God. And they're like, Ooh, right? And they're scared to death. And look at what it says. Angel said, don't be afraid. I love how angels are always saying that after they scare people. I love it. <laughs> don't be scared. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? You know why God picked them? It's because the news is not just for the rich. And the news is not just for the religious. And the news isn't just for those who have it all together. And the news isn't just for the people who are already in leadership or who think they're good enough. God says, I want the people to announce it to know they need me. It's for everybody. And look at what he says. Unto who? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Christ, the Lord. The people had been waiting for hundreds of years for this to happen. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah, when? I don't know. We haven't heard from God in 400 years. He's coming though. When? I don't know. What will he look like? I don't know. How will he be born? I don't know. But he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. That's what Micah says. They've been waiting. And 
now the day is here. And the silence is broken. And he picks these guys who are out in the field. He's, hey, you guys, you're the perfect ones to hear the news first before anybody else hears about this. My son has come. And think about this while he's laying in the manger, helpless. Can babies do anything? No, I mean, they can't do anything while Jesus is Right, like sucking his thumb. Do you see the title that he has? He's already Savior. He's the Messiah. He doesn't have to do anything to accomplish Messiahhood. That's who he is. He's the Christ, the one they've been waiting on. He's Lord over everything. He's the one who breathed it all into existence. I want you to think about this. The one who authored the universe is laying there totally helpless because he wanted to do that for you. And before he ever preached a sermon, before he ever did a miracle, before he ever called disciples, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's the Lord over everything. And so look at what it says. For unto you is born this day the city of David, a Savior, Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Where is he? Lying in a manger. Lying in a manger. That's different. I bet it'll be easy to find. Like, think about this. What if they were in somebody else's home? They're going to have to run around. Anybody have a baby in here? No, get out of here, you dirty shepherd. Like, no, no, no. Anybody over here have a baby? No, no, no. Like, but it's specific. More than a night of peace, they needed to experience care and comfort in the midst of their crazy life. And God puts them in this special place in the city of David, Bethlehem, to fulfill prophecy. And he's laid in a manger so the shepherds can find him and bring this news of comfort and peace in the midst of chaos. Look what it says. I love this. It's news for you. It's personal, but it, if you receive it, it can't stay personal. Like, what if they just would have stayed? That is some amazing news. All right, let's go to bed, guys. Can you imagine? But that's what we do every day, isn't it? We've got the best news ever. We have a Savior. We have a Lord. We have a Messiah. He's come, not just for us. He's come for all. Let's go to bed, guys. And we don't announce it. Look what they do. Look what it says, verse 15. So when, oh, sorry, verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising, saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace among those whom he's pleased. Verse 15, and when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that's happened with the Lord's made known to us. Verse 16, and they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Now, I can just picture Joseph, right? Like brand new dad. He doesn't have a clue what to do, right? Like, you, did anybody feel like that when you got home from the hospital? You're like, they let me take this baby home? I have no clue what I'm doing. Like, what am I supposed to do with this thing, right? Like, and he's, he doesn't know what to do. Mary's exhausted, and he's like, I don't know, just put the baby over there in the trough. I don't, like, and in the middle of this deal, like, Mary, you should get some rest. You know, it's been a crazy journey. We need a night of peace. Like, he has no clue the baby's going to be up every hour and a half, right? Like, you know, it's like, we need a night of peace. But you know, more than a night of peace, they needed care and comfort in the midst of the chaos. And so God sends uninvited guests. Like, how many of you in the hospital room, like, you know, your family's there, and you're like, oh, that's awesome. And then other people start showing up, and you're like, how did you even know I was here? Like, what are you doing? Like, wait, I, I need to rest here. Like, do you understand? I birthed a child out of me. Like, this is, this is a miraculous thing, but tiresome. Like, what are you doing here? You're not family. And in the middle of this, they're like, hey, anybody got a baby in a trough? Because we got news. And look what they say. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told concerning this child. Can you imagine? Look at me. In that moment, the 80 miles, the nobody caring in that moment before, the hard labor, in that moment, it was so worth it. It was so worth it. They have these people show up, and I'm sure they're wondering, are we still on the right track here? Like, I mean, if you're following God, isn't life supposed to be easier than this? Isn't marriage supposed to be? Isn't parenting? Isn't it like if we're doing the right things, like, isn't it supposed to be easy? Like, has God forgotten about us? Like, is all this stuff still happening? Like, I don't know. And in the midst of their chaos, God sends these agents of care and comfort, and they realize it's all still going according to plan. 
that's just not your plan. It's God's plan. And I felt this care and this comfort that no matter what they were walking through, look at me, God was still there. He was still working it out. Everything was still going to happen, just like he said. And they could know peace, not just when things were okay. They could know peace in the midst of their craziest day. Look at what it says. And all who heard this wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things. What did she do? What did it it say? Pondering them in her heart. Pondering them in her heart. I love this. Everybody who hears is like, wow, that's amazing. They don't just tell the family. They're like, everybody, do you know what just happened out there? Crazy shepherds. Like, everybody's like, that's crazy. Angels for you guys? Wow, that's weird. Like, that's really strange. Like, I wonder why God didn't just show up to us. We're like right here, right next to him. But he chose you guys out in the field. Like, you guys smell. Can you get a bath before you go back out? Like, and they all wonder. And they're like, wow, that's kind of an interesting story. But for Mary, she treasures it. Listen to me. Look right here. I have never, I've done lots of funerals. And I've never heard one person stand up and talk about a day where everything went right. As their fondest memory. It's always like the National Lampoon's Christmas days. Right? Where everything goes wrong that's comfort to you in the midst of that time of tragedy. Where you're like, man, what a memory. Like, well, you cry about it now. But then you laugh about it later. Like, that's Mary in the middle of this moment. She's like, what a crazy night. This is the best. I'm going to keep this in my heart forever. I'm going to pull it out and think about it the next time life is crazy. How in the middle of everything, even when life is nuts, I can still feel care and comfort from God. God knew exactly what they needed. It wasn't a night of peace. It was to know peace and care and comfort in the midst of chaos. And look at what it says. We'll wrap up here. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen as it had been told to them. I love this. Listen, for the shepherds, this may be why you're here. For the shepherds, you may just want to write this down. More than a night of obscurity, they needed an opportunity to witness. They were totally content being off by themselves. I love playing my little songs for my little sheep. Like, I just want to sit in my own little corner. I don't want to be around people. Is there anybody who's like that as you're going to Christmas today? I'm just going to get my plate. I'm going to go over in the corner. I'm going to try to avoid conversation. I don't want to talk politics. I'm not going to get roped into that thing. If I can just open the presents, white elephant, like, and I'll just get out of there, right? Like, is that your goal? God looked at them and he said, you know what you need more than a night in obscurity? You need an opportunity to share the good news that Jesus is for everybody. Like, that's what some of you need as you go to Christmas. Like, your goal is not to make it through the holiday without blowing up at your family who's crazy. Like, your job is to bring the good news of Jesus into the crazy. Like, you need an opportunity. You don't need to just sort of make it through unhindered. What, right? Like, you, you just need, to, you need this chance to share the good news. Listen to me. Look right here. Some of you feel like Christmas is ruined because it's not your story but Christmas. Some of you feel just like Mary and Joe, like you have to go through obstacle after obstacle, and you're just wondering, like, really? This is not what I need right now? And God looks down at you, and lovingly, as a father, he looks and he says, you can't see it, but I see now and next week and next month. I know what's coming next year. I know what's coming 10 years from now, and I want you to be ready. And so more than a night of peace or a day of peace where everything goes great in your marriage, more than a day where everything goes great with your grandkids, more than a day where everything goes great with your kids, more than a day where everything is just seamless and easy and perfect, like I want you to know the joy of peace and care and comfort and seeing my glory in the midst of the craziness. That's such a better gift. And so this Christmas, would you receive it? When the chaos comes, I don't need this. Thank you, God, I do need this. More than a day of ease, I need to learn peace and care and comfort from you when life is falling apart around me. That's the greatest gift. Let's pray.